Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Thomas Mac McClarty, CSIS Senior Advisor, President of McClarty Associates, a global advisory firm, and former counselor and chief of staff to President Bill Clinton. While in the White House, he helped enact the North American Free Trade Agreement, organized the first summit of the Americas, and became the president's special envoy to Latin America. As a dear friend of CSIS and a distinguished Latin America hand in his own right, Mac will present our keynote speaker. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. And Steve, thank you and Phil McLean and all of your associates for organizing such a, an excellent and timely meeting. You've, you've got a, 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 a large crowd and a distinguished crowd. Uh, and it's my, uh, always my pleasure to work with CSIS. Uh, in terms of my introduction today, uh, knowing uh, Secretary Steinberg's always fully engaged, I'll try to be brief, fierce, and decisive in my uh, introduction. I would be uh, uh, remiss if I did not note uh, uh, Ambassador Silva, who is uh, not only a good friend, but is such a distinguished and effective ambassador and other uh, members of the ambassadorial corps, and particularly from Columbia, that are, that are here today as well. I really w will deviate from any prepared remarks. My, my real feelings about Jim Steinberg can kind of be capsulized, perhaps, in that phrase that is often used to someone who has served uh, in the White House or in one of the cabinet positions. Uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for serving our country. I don't think anyone epitomizes that more than Deputy Secretary of State Jim Steinberg. Uh, he has served in three administrations in very important and responsible positions. He has handled all of his assignments with great effectiveness, professionalism, and with the highest of integrity. Uh, beginning in the Carter administration, then working with Senator Kennedy, Stan at Brookings, the Brookings Institute, and others uh, during that time. I met Jim, of course, in the Clinton administration when he was working for then Secretary of State uh, Warren Christopher, uh, Director of uh, Policy and at the State Department. And I often recall, particularly after Jim became Deputy uh, National Security Advisor with President Clinton, a phrase that re recurred both with Secretary Christopher during his tenure at State and in the White House. Well, I'd like to hear what Steinberg has to say about that on a particular decision. Uh, that's, a, that's a high compliment and a, a well-deserved one. Uh, I think particularly regarding Columbia, as we were uh, chatting before coming here, uh, Ambassador Silva, I think there's perhaps no better example, as many of you know here, where sustained leadership and consistent policy in both countries have served to advance the goals of a stated policy better than Plan Columbia and how we are seeing that playing out now in Columbia. So Steve, I think this meeting is particularly reflective of that. But beginning on a bipartisan basis with President Clinton, Speaker Hastert, which of course the Deputy Secretary National Security Advisor, the Deputy National Security Advisor at that time, played a major role in architecting that program. Continuing then to the Bush 43 administration, and now to uh, President Obama and his team and Secretary Clinton, we see a sustained effort here in our country, again, on a bipartisan basis. But also, I would be very remiss if you did not underscore the sustained leadership in Colombia with President Gaviria, President Pastrana, President Uribe, and his courageous policies, and now President Santos, a friend of 20 years. So we see now Colombia moving forward in such a remarkable an impressive manner with security, stability. We were talking about the economic growth rate uh, and the jobs created in Columbia, uh, a remarkable transformation that I think reflects those efforts. Now, we are at a critical time um, in terms of policy with Columbia, uh, with the Columbia Free Trade Agreement. And I'm sure that uh, the Deputy Secretary will speak to that in his comments. I would finally say that uh, 
as an important grace note that it has not just been Deputy Secretary Steinberg who has served our country, but also his wife, Sherry, who has done a truly outstanding job uh, in her responsibilities at the Office of Science and Technology, and I think will have a continuing role at the University of Syracuse. Uh, Jim Steinberg served with great distinction. I, I saw it firsthand at the LBJ School as dean there uh, before returning to public service, and he will do uh, an outstanding job in his new uh, career here shortly at the Maxwell School at the University of Syracuse. So with that, Mr. Secretary, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Mac, for that exceedingly generous uh, introduction. I'm uh, touched, and uh, it means a lot coming from you because of all that you've done uh, for your country and especially on Latin America and the ambassador and to so many uh, good friends, current and former colleagues uh, in the audience in and out of government. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, I was telling uh, Lourdes on the way over, this could be my last speech as Deputy Secretary. I've only got about two weeks to go. And um, I, I was particularly eager to do it, frankly, uh, for the reasons that Mac outlined, because it has been a, a special privilege for me to come back into government and continue the work that was begun in my last time in government under the Clinton administration, and to see both the enormous progress that was made and the, the realization of the vision we had back in the late 1990s, and to be able to be a small part of carrying that work forward <coughs> to a new uh, height. And it has, uh, in every respect, been gratifying, because as Max said, first, it is a, a wonderful case study in successful policy making, which makes it useful for me going back to academic lives to have a, a, a case study of something of a success story rather than what went wrong, which is the kind of standard uh, case study. But also because uh, it really does reflect a, an incredibly broad uh, set of uh, actors in both countries working together over an extended period of time, and it really does demonstrate that if you're going to be successful in policy, you have to establish a broad base of support, not just among policymakers, but among publics. And I think that has been a key uh, feature of why this policy has been so successful, the, the strong commitment of both the American people and the Colombian people, as well as the political and uh, government leaders. And it has been, in the last two and a half years, really just a tremendous opportunity to work with the two administrations in Colombia and, and now with uh, President Santos and uh, Foreign Minister Olguin and uh, the ambassador to take this forward. Uh, over the two and a half years since I've been a Deputy Secretary, I've, uh, I've had the privilege of making this an important part of my job. I've made two trips to Colombia uh, since becoming Deputy Secretary, and on my last trip, I had a chance to launch the High-Level Partnership Dialogue, and just uh, a few weeks ago, host the second meeting of the High-Level uh, par uh, Partnership Dialogue here in Washington. So, and we've seen in very concrete terms, in ways that I'll outline in a minute, just how much has been done. But I also think it's important to just remember how far we have come. Uh, when I came into government and not that long ago, people were, some quarters were talking about Colombia as a, as a near or potentially failed state. And yet today, Colombia is the fourth largest recipient of foreign direct um, uh, investment in Latin America behind Brazil, Chile, and Mexico. And along with uh, tremendous economic growth and the uh, achievements on the security front, we have now seen a movement to an even more broad-based strategy, the, the democratic prosperity agenda that makes sure that not only will Colombia and Colombians be secure and that the country will be prosperous, but all of the people in Colombian society will share in these great achievements. It's true you can talk about statistics, and statistics are really important. You can just think, for example, that since 2002, terrorist attacks are down 77%. Homicides down 56 percent and kidnappings down at 92 percent. But what's even more important, and I know many of you in the audience know, is the palpable sense of a future and security that so many people have. The work is not ended, but the sense of optimism, the sense that uh, Colombia can not only uh, survive but thrive is really critical. And these most recent presidential elections, I think, are a strong reflection of the, the great democratic tradition of Colombia and the strength of the democratic commitment of Colombian society. Uh, the, this is a model that serves as an exemplar uh, all through the region and around the world that people can look to as an example of societies that come together to vindicate that uh, democratic objective. And since the election of President Santos, you can see what a remarkable step forward 
that has been taken and the broad-based commitment of President Santos on his administration. In just a, a short period of time, uh, the recently enacted land restitution and victims reparation law, addressing the foundational causes of conflict within Colombia and assisting hundreds of thousands of displaced persons and other vulnerable populations recovered land, which is an, a, both an pl important political achievement but also a strong commitment of resources. He's begun to heal the breach between the executive branch and the legislative branch and strengthening the independent prosecutor's office as well as moving forward on a host of human rights cases. He's working to strengthen relations with civil society, working with Vice President Garcon to build a sense of trust between civil society uh, and the government rather than a sense of conflict and adversarialness. And President Santos and his administration, uh, led by the foreign minister, have made improving relations with their neighbors as a priority, which is paying dividends already, including, as we've seen, extradition to Colombia of important narco traffickers. And the continued work that the Santos administration is doing uh, at going after the FARC network and its key leaders uh, with the uh, recent successful operations is just a further example of the broad-based effort to deal with the full range of challenges. And we in the United States are honored to partner with uh, Colombia across this full uh, set of issues. And to make sure that this is not a one-dimensional relationship, we instituted the high-level partnership dialogue to broaden and strengthen uh, the range of our engagements. And if you look at the topics that we uh, have uh, established as our formalized working groups, science and technology, not just because of Sherry, um, uh, energy, environmental protection and climate change, culture and education, social and economic opportunities, and of course, the very important set of issues around democracy, human rights, and good governance. And at our last meeting, we had more than 60 Colombian government officials, including Vice President Garcon, Foreign Minister Olguin, and many other cabinet and sub-cabinet officials who met with more than 120 U.S. government representatives from more than 19 agencies. And this is more than a talk shop. As uh, the Vice President and I agreed at the very first meeting of our group, the uh, Human Rights Working Group, we're focused on concrete agenda, concrete results to demonstrate to our people in both countries that this is a partnership that delivers the goods. So, for instance, on the human rights side, we agreed to jointly track certain key human rights cases on a monthly basis and to identify obstacles and better direct our assistance to Colombia. And we on the United States side reiterated our support to help build uh, the Fiscalia and make sure that uh, we can continue the important uh, work that's taking place there. On energy, a topic close to Max Hart, we reviewed existing partnerships in renewable and fossil fuel energy as well as exploring additional avenues of collaboration in regional uh, electrical interconnection, shale gas, and mining. And Columbia will soon host the first plenary meeting for the Action Plan on Racial and Ethnic Equality, a plan, a commitment that we jointly signed during my first visit to Colombia. Beyond these efforts, we are supporting Colombia's aspirations uh, to become uh, members of the OECD. And in these uh, HLPD meetings, we also agreed to enhance cultural and educational cooperation in Colombia and encourage economic and social opportunities for Afro-descendants and indigenous communities, which are such an important part of the fabric of Colombian society. And together, we're working on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, including implementing the Cancun uh, outcome and looking forward to working together at the next meeting in Durban, South Africa. Now, having said that we broaden the partnership to all these issues, we continue to recognize that we can't uh, neglect the issue of uh, drug trafficking on both the supply and the demand side and the impact that it has on our societies. And so, while we have not achieved all of our counter-narcotics goals, our cooperation together has helped Colombia become more stable, denied millions of dollars in illegal drug revenues to the FARC, and reduced the amount of pure cocaine capable of being produced in Colombia by 59%, from 700 metric tons in 2001 to 290 metric tons in 2009, which has had a positive impact here in our society. And we must continue, and Secretary Clinton has made clear that we take responsibility for continuing to do our side of the business, which is dealing with the problem of drug demand. Now this is, f I've talked so far primarily about our work together on bilateral issues and helping to strengthen uh, Colombia's security, economic prosperity, and inclusivity. But what has been especially rewarding for me is to see the growing role that Colombia is playing 
on the regional and international stage. As we like to say in, in our business, Columbia has gone from being a consumer of security to a provider of security and support for others who face even greater challenges. Today, Columbia sits on the UN Security Council, trains police to help other nations meet their law enforcement challenges, and is playing a leading role and now successfully in uh, bringing Honduras back into the inter-American system. And I think that this is, as we've taken examples from our collective and, and successful work together, Colombia continues to help others deal with these challenges. So, for example, the institutional capability in counter-narcotics built in Colombia over the last decade has allowed Colombia to share its security expertise with others. Over the last two years, Colombia has trained more than 9,000 police from 18 Latin American and three West African states. It's trained hundreds of Mexican investigators and dozens of Mexican helicopter pilots. It's offered similar assistance to its Central American neighbors who are deeply affected by transnational crime and drug trafficking. Now, of course, as Mac previewed, I wouldn't want to end my uh, discussion here without touching on the U.S.-Columbia Free Trade Agreement, the U.S.-Columbia Trade Promotion Agreement, which will open new markets and create new jobs and opportunities for both of our peoples. We've been impressed by the level of commitment and, more importantly, by the quick action by the Colombian government to address labor-related concerns. In April, the U.S. and Colombian governments agreed to an ambitious and comprehensive action plan that includes major, swift, and concrete steps that the Colombian government has agreed to take to address outstanding labor concerns, in addition to the, the good work it is doing on the human rights front. The action plan contains several milestones, including 20 milestones due by April 22nd, which the Colombian government needed to accomplish for the, us in the administration to initiate technical discussions with the Congress. On May 4th, we finished our review of those accomplishments and announced that we were ready to move forward to the next stage in the process. Specific improvements that have already occurred under the action plan include expanded eligibility for Columbia's protection program to include not only labor leaders, but also rank and file activists and those seeking to form a union. Over 95 judicial police investigators have been assigned exclusively to pursuing cases of labor violence with early identification of any union affiliation now mandatory. And ahead of schedule, Columbia enacted legislation to move up the effective date of new penalties for abuse of cooperatives, which can help evade worker protections. And I'm pleased to see that uh, there's been strong support, not only here in the United States, but in Colombia for uh, the action plan. According to Julio Roberto Gomez, the Secretary General of the Confederación General de Trabajo, it is, in his words, positive that President Santos has put forth an agreement that includes issues such as freedom of association, human rights, and guarantees for workers as they are related to the FTA. Or as Jose Luciano Sanin, Director of the General of the Escuela Nacional Sindical, has observed, we are witnessing a moment that we have not had in at least 20 years. After the 1991 Constitution, this would be our most important agenda for the labor movement. All of these steps are a strong indication of Colombia's commitment to working to address the issues that the administration and others have identified. Now, of course, there's still more work to be done under the action plan, including several items that we've agreed to see completed before June 15th. We are uh, confident and optimistic about the steps that Colombia will take and allow us to move our own process forward to pass the FTA this year, as the Secretary has said. This is a really set of remarkable achievements. Just think, in the last two weeks, separate from commitments under the action plan, the Colombian government has engineered a breakthrough protection agreement with the teachers union, moved forward on a decree for collective bargaining for the public sector, concluded a tripartite agreement, signed by the country's second largest labor federation itself and business, achieved the first uh, convictions in a controversial so-called Soacha false positives murder case, and seeing Colombians elected to the administrative tribunal of the ILO. And in all these issues, President Obama said it best. I believe, in his words, that in, America's in the Americas today, there are no senior partners and there are no junior partners. There are only equal partners. Of course, equal partnerships, in turn, demand a sense of shared responsibility. In Colombia, I have found, and we have, a true and willing partner. 
I am, as I say, truly impressed by what's achieved, but also know that you all understand that this is a never-ending effort and that each step needs to be uh, succeeded by more and more determination to see the achievement of these goals of security and prosperity of inclusivity and to see that the fate of Colombia as it seeks to achieve them is deeply intertwined with our own. This is a special partnership for us in the United States and I've been privileged to be a small part of it over the last two and a half years. So thank you for your attention today and I look forward to your questions. <clears throat> Go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I do not have a question. My name is Juan Carlos Esguerra, but there is an assessment I have to make. I was brought here to talk about justice, and if I was brought here to talk about justice, there is an act of justice that I have to make. And that is, Mr. McClarty, to say again, after all these years, I remember that when almost nobody believed, you believed. When almost everybody turned around, you gave us a, a, your hand, and you were a great supporter of Colombia in the middle of the night during very bad circumstances. And now that we are seeing uh, a bright sky and a beautiful day, we have to remember the night just in order to say, in the name of the Republic of Colombia and of every Colombian, thank you very much, Mr. Petlati. <laughs> Steve Landy, Manchester Trades. I don't think there's any question that a combination of Obama administration education and Columbia action has really made this agreement ready to pass. The question, of course, is that we have a serious domestic political problem in the United States that has nothing to do with Columbia. Well known. I've been in trade policy for umpteen years, and it is very strange that something as basic as trade adjustment assistance, which has been U.S. policy for 34 years, is now being questioned. But the real question, in my mind, is does Columbia understand this? Do they realize that this is not really aimed at them? What happens if because of trade adjustment assistance, if Columbia, or because of disagreement, if Columbia, which I assume they will live up to the obligation? And I'd like to ask Mac to speak a little bit on this question, too, because of his his experience over the previous couple of years, uh, excuse me, during the previous Democratic administration in this area about what do we do if the Republicans, re and I should know I shouldn't say this, but I'm a <laughs> Democrat. What do we do if the Republicans really keep their feet in and do not compromise on this Trade Adjustment Assistance Act? Thank uh, you. Let, let me just say a quick word and then I'll either invite or allow our, our people sitting here who are not really part of the presentation to either decide whether they want to answer or not. Um, you know, I think, as you know well, from the perspective of the administration, uh, in the long run, uh, we have to, if we're going to pursue a trade agenda, which is enormously important to our future for jobs and, and, and uh, competitiveness, that there has to be a broad base of support in society. And that there's no doubt from our perspective that, uh, that the Columbia FTA, like Panama and South Korea, are win-wins for both societies, but not for every single person. And trade, inevitably, uh, has some dislocating features. And the best way to move forward is not to retreat from trade, but to make sure that everybody can benefit from it, that people who are inadvertently, at least in the short term, uh, suffering from trade have an opportunity to have that blow cushioned and to be ready to compete uh, in, in that world. And that's why we want a comprehensive approach that includes uh, active pursuit of, of FTAs, including new ones that we're negotiating, like the, the TPP in East Asia but also to make sure that our, the, the American worker and the American people are part of this and feel uh, beneficiary. So that's why we think this is all a part of a package, and we, uh, we strongly hope that the Congress sees that uh, we won't have the support of the American people if we don't have a comprehensive strategy. Okay. <laughs> Mac, you want to well, I'll, I'll be very brief. I think uh, Secretary Steinberg outlined precisely uh, the, 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 the balance here that needs to be achieved, should be achieved. It started really with President Obama's comments and remarks of doubling our exports, and that really set the predicate for moving forward on freight, uh, trade agreements. There's not that big a gap in a, in a dollar sense uh, between the Republican and Democratic position. 
clearly there needs to be a deal in the middle i believe there will be it should take about an hour it's going to take a little longer than that but i think at the end of the day they'll get there one more Phil McLean from here in CSIS. Uh, since you're returning to academia, let me ask you a classic uh, college-type question. Uh, you know, compare and contrast. Uh, you know, compare and contrast uh, what happened uh, in Colombia and U.S. policy in Colombia with what uh, pick, pick a country out there in the Middle East and and how we d did things differently and uh, and uh, and what's to be recommended and not recommended. Well, I think. Um I'm glad it was a compare and contrast and not a what if. I've been, I've been, I spent two and a half years resisting hypotheticals and I'm now going to go back to a world where I can actually ask them of my students all the time. I think, what I think the, the biggest success um, of uh, Plan Columbia and what we've done together uh, were really the things that, that Mac touched on, which is first, we had a strong bipartisan basis uh, for this in the United States. And on the big challenges, whether it's uh, providing security and moving forward on uh, social inclusion in Colombia or dealing with democratic transformation uh, in the Middle East, these things don't happen overnight. They require a sustained commitment of both policy and resources uh, to make it happen. And there needs to be a sense among all the parties that you're in it for the long term uh, and the commitment's in it for a long term. If you don't have that, then people will game the system because they'll assume it's a flash in the pan or that the kinds of benefits, the costs are often up front. In the, in, in, uh, are front-loaded and the benefits are in the long term. So let's take Egypt, for example. One of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest um, impulses to the revolution uh, in Egypt was the lack of economic opportunity. The fact that the system, although there'd been some economic reforms, was not providing jobs and opportunity, particularly for many of the reasonably well-educated young people who are coming out of universities or training programs. Uh, and so addressing that uh, economic need and that those social and economic uh, needs is critically important, but it doesn't happen overnight. We can give some short-term economic assistance, but what's really needed is to stimulate long-term economic opportunity. But that doesn't happen overnight. And so the people of Egypt, like the people of Colombia, need to know that we have a long-term plan, that there will be some short-term sacrifices to get the Egyptian economy into a place which can produce good jobs for people over the long term. And we need to find ways to give them the confidence that if they take the necessary steps, that the United States and Europe and others will be with them. That's what we did in Plan Columbia. We were able, I think, to be convincing, because we had bipartisan support, because there was a strong commitment to that, that we could do this. It wasn't a one congressional session or one presidential administration. Those are hard to do, as Mac will tell you. Um, but when it's done, it's America at its finest. And I think that's something that we all need to focus on, is how do we build these strong uh, commitments that have the support of both parties, the people as well as government, and in both countries, uh, to sustain these kinds of long-term challenges. And, and the fact that we've done it together in Columbia, I think, shows it can be done, and that can give people some confidence and encouragement to look for ways to replicate that. Okay, one more. Thanks, uh, and uh, I wish you the very best, Thank Jim. Um, my question goes to uh, the congressional uh, play going on with the FTA. You thought and said you were confident that by the end of the year we would see something. Uh, in my conversations with, for example, folks, and I won't say who, uh, in, in connection with Korea, we're thinking that they are going to see an FTA um, approved in Congress by the August 2nd uh, uh, recess. Um, it, it's, it's, I guess my, my question is both to you and to Mac, um, whether uh, uh, Columbia is prepared for the possibility that this thing uh, will go beyond August 2nd, uh, and, and, and how does... Uh, 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 how do we explain this under the circumstances? Um, and do, you, do we really need to have to explain it? Uh, do you think that deal that Mac, you thought, was so close to uh, uh, getting can be gotten by August 2nd? Well, I, I'd say just my, my reference at the end of the year, I've learned a couple of things in my government services. First is it never hurt, hurts to quote your boss. Um, <laughs> and, and second, it's never smart to say something different from your boss. So. Uh, but I think what the Secretary meant to imply with that is that, I mean, she's realistic. She served in the Congress. I don't think she wanted to set, you know, some commitments to make it feel like somehow if we don't get it by June, July, whatever, that that's a failure. 
I think it was a strong commitment that we ought to find a way to do it this year. Obviously, we'd all like to see the logjam broken and, and move forward on these things sooner. So I don't mean to imply that it, it's not possible to get it done sooner. I just want to uh, err a bit on the side of caution because often, even as Max says, even if we resolve the issues around the TAA, there are always floor scheduling things. I worked in the Senate myself. And so it, it, the unpredictability of congressional action is something we just all have to live with. I don't know if you want to add anything. Else. All right. Good. Well, thank you all. Really appreciate it. Secretary Steinberg, thank you for taking time to, to join us today at this very timely meeting. I would agree with everything you said, save one section. And that is when you repeatedly said I was pleased to play a small role in Plan Columbia and other uh, issues. The truth is that Jim Steinberg has been at the center of American foreign policy for at least two administrations, if not three. We thank you for your public service and service to our country, and we do wish you well. We'll now, Steve, turn it over to you.